Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, Ben. Welcome to the FII. Um, to introduce our guest, which I'm sure he's no stranger to many of you, uh, Ben Horowitz has co-founded the Andreessen Horowitz uh, Investment Fund in 2009 with his phenomenal partner, Mark Andreessen. The firm has over $35 billion under management and invests in crypto software and also healthcare, consumer management, enterprise, fintech, and games. But Ben, most importantly, you're also a voice for what the transition of VCs could be. You've transformed the way a traditional VC operates, and I'd love for you to share with us how did you get to the realization that you needed to shake up the system? Yeah, well, uh, you know, venture capital firms historically have been very small partnerships, and uh, because of that, they've kind of had to focus in uh, sort of very specific areas of technology, and th there's reason for that because uh, when you get a bunch of extremely smart people together, they don't always necessarily get along. And so, you know, you have to keep it small to keep them from killing each other, as uh, Mike Moritz said. And so uh, one of the things that um, we realize is that if you decompose the firm into basically a set of smaller firms focused on different technological areas, such as crypto, bio, um, infrastructure, and so forth, uh, you could have the power of the size um, with the precision of the smaller firms. And when you came up with this initiative and the concept to restructure, was that pre or post COVID? Uh, well, it, it was a little bit, uh, a little bit pre COVID and a little bit during COVID and a little bit post COVID. Amazing. Yeah. And this decentralization of the workforce that we've all seen throughout COVID, it's affected different sectors in different ways. How has it impacted your work stream? Yeah, so it, um, COVID was very interesting in that we were forced out of the office and to go remote. And we noticed um, there were many, many changes in the technology in industry that came out of that. The first thing that we kind of found out is we were investors in a company called GitHub, which basically is a product that every engineer uses. And you could see from the GitHub logs that about 42% of the engineers had migrated out of San Francisco out of Silicon Valley during COVID. And so that was a clear indication that um, for the first time, really, uh, the kind of center of technological talent was going to distribute kind of around the country. Um, and then similarly, we looked at our own employee uh, base and the desire to be able to have more flexibility and not be in the office every day was, was going to be a, a real thing. So, you know, from that, we kind of basically surmised that there were going to be multiple uh, technological centers in the U.S. And we're seeing that now with uh, both kind of Los Angeles and New York emerging as quite significant. So in this spread of talent around the United States, does that mean that Silicon Valley can be replicated? And is it exclusive as a mindset to just the United States of America, or is this something that could actually spread around the world, given that people are now working in disparate various areas? Yes, well, I, I think it, it, it definitely can move um, because the talent can move. Mm -hmm. And so the key, you know, I think a lot of times people look at it through a money lens and say, well, you know, where's the capital? Or where's, but, but the capital finds the talent in technology. Um, and historically, the way it's worked is when, you, when everybody was kind of proximate to each other, if you were a genius computer science and you were born in Riyadh or you were born in Bangladesh, you would likely move to Silicon Valley. That, that was the right place to go to, to have a great career. Um, but now, because you can work from anywhere, anywhere where you can cluster a lot of talent um, has, a, has a real chance. And so the way we look at it is any area that's got a great computer science um, program at a university is, has a potential to be a technology center. So would you say then for a city that really would like to attract that kind of engineering talent, is the key the business, the funding, or is the key having the supply chain from the engineers that come out of the education system? Yeah, it's definitely the third. Um, really? Because money moves. Okay. <laughs> like, it's very easy for a dollar to go from Silicon Valley to New York or, or Riyadh or Berlin or anywhere. Um, the, the talent is, is the much more, or the much less fungible property. Interesting.
So when you talk about the change that the world has experienced because of COVID and this talent migration, how has your focus changed? I know you've done a lot of investment in bio and healthcare, mm -hmm. but has that become overwhelming investments now? Has that lessened what you're looking at in other sectors, or are you pretty even across the board? Um, well, th there's many interesting areas. Bio and healthcare is particularly interesting because we moved from you know, what was a chemical model of a human to an information model, and that's opened up all kinds of possibilities that we didn't have before. So, uh, for example, if you look at cancer, um, in the chemical model of cancer, a lot of people die of cancer because, not because it's not curable, but because we catch it too late. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you have to get a biopsy to figure out if you have cancer, and generally people don't get a biopsy until they have a lump because, you know, it's a very dangerous procedure. With an information model, you can sequence somebody's blood and apply machine learning and figure out if they have, you know, stage zero cancer in, you know, many, many different types. Mm -hmm. And so through a blood test, you can diagnose cancer, which basically means you can cure cancer because if you get it at stage zero, most kinds of cancer are already curable. Mm -hmm. And so where would you say you see the greatest opportunity? There's the opportunity of today, but mm -hmm. then there's also the opportunity of the future. And w what are the two that you would flag for this room of people who are really interested to see where your company is investing? Yeah, so I think that the big, um, the, the, the most obvious exciting platforms are bio, AI, where we're seeing like phenomenal rate of change and breakthroughs. And then, uh, crypto, which is uh, going to be sort of the equivalent of the internet of money and property rights, which kind of transform, will over time transform virtual world into being a kind of full-fledged economy. So crypto, yes. what are your thoughts? And how do we manage the wild west that seems to be out there? <laughs> yeah, well, managing the wild west is a harder problem. So crypto is really kind of fundamentally important in the same way, you know, when we started the internet many years ago, we didn't have native money or native property rights. So what you ended up with is kind of single companies becoming extremely powerful who uh, can con could control large parts of the internet. It wasn't sort of a free market economy. Um, and crypto is basically the technology that transforms that and gives you those things. Uh, that's a, like a fundamental, important, powerful change for humanity. At the same time, uh, you can also build a casino on it. <laughs> and, uh, and that is, there's a lot of activity on that side as well. And so I think we do need um, kind of smart policy to kind of recognize um, what is, uh, you know, ga the gambling side and, and, and what is the kind of fundamental building block of a more open and fair internet. Interesting. And when we look at AI, you hear the fear factor on one end, but then the profound positive impact. How do you as an investor, when you're looking at the various initiatives that you're investing in, how do you make your judgment on where this is going and how do you stay on the light path of good versus where this could possibly go? Yeah, well, I think, you know, Andy Grove said years ago, the, the uh, former um, uh, CEO of Intel, somebody asked him, is the microprocessor good or bad? And he said, well, that's the wrong question because that's like asking, is steel good or bad? doesn't matter, it is. And, you know, once something is, it's our job to make it good. Uh, and that takes a lot of work and forethought. But these technologies, you know, you can't put it back in the bottle. It's, you know, outlying AI, it's basically you're outlying linear algebra, you're outlying math. <laughs> and, you can outlaw math, but people are still going to do math, and it's going to, you know, there's not actually that kind of um, policy answer to it. So what you want to do is you want to work to build the right kind of AI in the right way uh, that's good for everybody. Okay. So, Ben, you've written two books. One's called The Hard Thing About Hard Things, and What You Do Is Who You Are. Mm -hmm. From when you wrote those books until today, are there any nuggets that you still wake up every morning and go, I was right? <laughs> well, you know, they, they were popular books, so I, I, I feel like um, they were right. I, you know, to me, the, in what you do is who you are, kind of the biggest thing that I think is, is right is that when you talk about culture, particularly in companies, um, it's not a set of beliefs. 
it's a set of actions and behaviors. And so often people focus on, well, here's our values. Well, your values don't mean anything. The only thing that matters is like, how do people behave every day? And so if you don't write that down <laughs> and you don't enforce that and you don't have mechanics around that, you really don't have, you know, you, you don't really have a culture. Amazing. Well, Ben, words of wisdom. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much for having thank me. You.